Hello, welcome back to Today in Bad Theology. Today, we're gonna help liberate an oppressed white male from scary social realities. Yes, welcome back to Today in Bad Theology. Today, we're looking at an article that Professor Gerald McDermott wrote about woke culture at evangelical universities. It's a study in what is wrong with many theological responses to racism and how to address it in our country. Now, I wanna go about this in three different parts. First, I wanna look at precisely what it is that McDermott says is wrong about teaching that racism is real at evangelical colleges. Then, I'm gonna take a look at a wonderfully written, uh, very Christian response by a professor at one of the institutions McDermott complains about uh, who exposes what's wrong theologically with what McDermott is doing, or at least uncovers that, starts us down the path I want to go. And finally, I'm going to look at why McDermott's theology here is bad, how he uses his theology to deflect the conversation away from what he says he wants to do, basically just to make sure that nothing ever changes. Now, before we get too much further in, I need to come clean. Gerald McDermott was a professor of mine at Roanoke College. I was a double major in history and philosophy, and the philosophy and religion faculty were, were joint, and I had a class with Gerald McDermott in the course of my philosophy uh, degree. Um, so I, I had him as a professor with all the baggage that can come with that, and I debated a great deal whether I should indeed uh, tackle this article. Um, and, and in fact, the, the article that I'm going to read in response to him uh, helped me say, I, I think I can do this in a way that's perhaps constructive. Um, but so, you know, yeah, there, there's, there's a history there. I was his student about 20 years ago. Now, what is it that McDermott says is wrong? Well, McDermott starts off this article in the, the journal First Things. Uh, parents from Biden voting areas such as Westchester County, New York, Maricopa County, Arizona, and Northern Virginia have been protesting the teaching of critical race theory in their public schools. So, this might turn you off already, or it may, I don't know, maybe it turns you on already. The, they object that it divides students by race and intimates that skin color denotes either guilt or innocence. Now, he starts this off sounding like it's journalism, but it's not journalism. This is totally an op-ed piece that he's writing. And he parrots here the line from those who are opposed to teaching that racism is real. Right? That The idea that if you teach that racism is real, that will actually teach kids to be racist. Right? That somehow there is no racism unless we're teaching kids that racism is there. Um, this does not work. All right? That's not how that works. I, I went to school K through 12 with a lot of people who were in the same class as I was throughout. They had English every year. They still can't speak in complete sentences, right? Just learning that it's a thing doesn't make you do it, all right? And, and in fact, learning that it's a thing can help you not do it. Like learning not to put your hand on a hot stove teaches, oh my, maybe I won't do that next time. McDermott seems to be thinking that if we can just not tell anyone the stove is hot, maybe the stove will be cold. But I digress. Now, McDermott goes at critical race theory, uh, describing it as an ideology. You know, it, it, and this is, let's see if I can find the citation here. Christian parents often assume that evangelical institutions are free from such secular ideologies. But recent developments at three leading evangelical schools suggest they need to look more carefully. Right? Ideology is a term that is tricky because it's used all the time to mean what other people are thinking. Right? My thoughts are good. Your thoughts are ideology. All right? Now, like all terms, it can become useless with that broad of a definition. That's not the definition most of us are thinking of. Ideology tends to be a little bit more specific. We would say things like, you know, the Soviets had an ideology, right? 
there there was an ideology there was there was this lenin's version of marxism that they deployed as their explanation for why they did what they did and you can argue of, were they actually trying to be communists or not um, but did they really think this was going to work or not or was this just a justification they slapped on whatever crazy idea they came up with uh, but there was that was an ideology right people had to be schooled in how to think and talk the leninist way the nazis had an ideology right i don't think anybody can argue they absolutely stuck to their ideology right down to murdering people who they thought were inferior fighting to the bitter end in a war that they knew was lost the nazis had an ideology and they lived it out in all of its horror right so you know the soviets the nazis and people fighting against racism you want to really want to lump those three together I mean, I can, see, I can see the Soviets and the Nazis being lumped together in ideology, but simply people fighting racism. Right? Without actually saying that, he's, he's thinking it very loudly for us. And, and he knows that that's what his readers in, in First Things want to hear. There's some things that McDermott claims are the problem with this wokeness. He loves to use this term woke. The woke, he says, attack white supremacy culture, which they say includes things like individualism, objectivity, linear thinking, and logic. Now, I know exactly where he's coming from on this and what he's talking about, and so I can only assume that he is intentionally misunderstanding things that he has heard and read, because... I know what's going on with all of these things, right? When he says woke culture, which is his slur for, I don't know, acknowledging racism is real, uh, says that individualism is a white supremacy thing. Well, you know, as a professor of religion, McDermott should be familiar with the concept that the radical turn towards the self and the importance of the self over and above the system or the people around it is an enlightenment product. It's something that comes out of Western Europe during the enlightenment. Uh, it's not even a reformation thing. It's after the reformation, all right? Now, sometimes academics will get too carried away to the point that they, they think there was no concept of the self before the enlightenment. Obviously there was, um, but the idea that we are individuals not beholden to what anybody else tells us is a fairly recent invention, and it's a white people's invention. Right? Nobody likes to hear this because we've all been schooled that that's the, that's the ideal. Think for yourself. Uh, that radical emphasis on the individual is a fairly recent creation. Um, and, and that's a pretty basic religious concept when you're reading religious texts um, that prior to the Enlightenment, uh, the church is thinking corporately. And after the Enlightenment, the church is thinking about individual souls. Um, that's painting with broad strokes, but I am correct saying it. Uh, objectivity. Right? He attacks objectivity. Again, we live in a world where we know that objectivities are subjective. <laughs> there is no such thing as pure objectivity. This actually was decided a very long time ago in, in terms of a human lifespan. Before McDermott was born, this was understood in, in religious schools. So to be attacking these folks as complaining uh, objectivity is a, is a false thing. You're supposed to know this shit already, okay? Yeah, objectivity. You, you can't have pure objectivity. You just can't. Get over it. Right? Attacking linear thinking. You know, this is... I, 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 I'm different. I don't think that I've ever been diagnosed with a sort of divergent thinking way. Uh, but I, I inherited from my father what we call... We don't have um, tangents. We have quantum leaps. Like, how the hell did you get from here to there? Uh, I don't know. Made sense to me. There are many ways of thinking. Linear thinking is one way. Prizing linear thinking above all others is something that grew out of the Enlightenment and the scientific revolution in North and Western Europe. 
It's a hallmark of being white and in charge. And finally, the, the worst of these misrepresentations is <laughs> he, he says that, that the woke attack logic as being a tool of white supremacy. Um, in the Enlightenment, in Western science, white people from Northern and Western Europe were understood to be the norm against which all else was measured. Right? So any application of logic came from the point of view that somehow white folks were normal and everything else was somehow abnormal. So darker skinned folks were abnormal. Men were normal, therefore women were abnormal. Uh, men who uh, did not exhibit certain mental behaviors or certain ways of thinking were normal. Everything else was abnormal. And, and so logic is applied with the implicit assumption that whiteness is normal. It doesn't say logic is faulty. If I, if I say, if it is raining, then the ground is wet, and you say, well, the ground is not wet, I can say, well, then it's not raining. Right? That's, that's true. But if your logical propositions depend on white being normal, your answers are going to come back faulty, no matter how sound the logic actually is. Right? You can have a perfectly sound argument, and if your terms and your premises are false, it's not going to work. Right? And and that's the claim here. Logic, as we deploy it, too often has premises that assumes that whiteness is normal. And so everything falls into that. I mean, I mean it's, it's not just whiteness, you know. Science is, 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 medical science knows how to spot a heart attack in a man, right? We know how to spot it in a woman, but we don't care, right? It's just not that important to us. Um, the symptoms in women are different than the ones in men when they have a heart attack. Um, but we don't do that, and we don't take women seriously when they come into the hospital saying, I'm having the following symptoms. Well, is it our time of the month? Uh, no, that's, I stopped having that years ago. Oh, well, maybe it's a lack of estrogen. Then. That is, using your logic might be perfectly sound, but your premises are false. Oh, she's a woman. She doesn't know what she's talking about. So... Right away, he's blowing every dog whistle. He's winking at every person who thinks that talking about racism is what actually causes racism. And he's misrepresenting the position that he is after. So this is not a fair article. This is not a fair argument. He is coming at this from the point of view that believing racism is real makes you an ideologue. And basic things that everyone should accept that actually everyone should already know aren't true are rejected by these crazy woke people. Now, I had uh, a lot of different things I wanted to say about this that I, I had to rein in uh, because they wouldn't have been very fair. And uh, I want to thank, I, I do not know Dr. Vincent Bacote, I hope I'm saying his last name correctly, uh, uh, for writing a response to uh, Dr. McDermott, uh, an article called Wide Awoke at Wheaton in the journal Current. Um, Bacote phrases this rather as a, um, a series of laments that the world is in fact the way it is, and that McDermott unwittingly proves that everything that he says isn't wrong is in fact wrong. Um, and Bacote, it's, it's, I'm gonna, I've linked to both articles in the video description. You can read McDermott's original and you can read Bacote's response. Um, it writes a lovely piece here, so I'm not, I'm not gonna get into little bits and pieces of things McDermott might have said because McDermott's own argument takes things out of context and I don't, we don't wanna take things that McDermott said out of context. But um, Bacote gets down to the, the nitty-gritty near the end of his article. And there's, McDermott argues that um, you should base your racial teaching. What, what is race? Is it a thing? And how are humans to interact? That should all be rooted in the gospel and not in this secular ideology. Uh, and Bacote responds to that claim. And I'm going to quote what he says here. 
We, and he's talking about as a professor at an evangelical college, we at evangelical colleges have the potential to lead the way. He's talking about on race and on all justice issues. But the story thus far has been more a sad tale of resistance in which we label those in search of justice with tags like social gospel, cultural Marxist, woke, and whatever comes next. Bacot gets at what I want to talk about here, right? He, he laments that this is the situation, right? We have a great deal of theological ammunition we could use against racism, sexism, ecological disaster, and all kinds of things. And, and he writes from an evangelical tradition, and that's, that's not my tradition. I would argue my faith tradition likewise has a wealth of things we could use uh, in this struggle. But that's not how it's worked out for decades. The church, and this is true across denominations, has resisted all the things that its own theology should be telling it to do. We've resisted racial justice. We've resisted um, ecological justice. We've resisted sexual and gender justice. Right? Theology has been used against those things or just has been left to the sidelines to say, we're not going to talk about this. So the problem, why you can't just turn to the gospel to solve these things. Well, maybe you could, but the, the problem is you haven't. And not like not like you just found out about these problems this morning and you had, you know, we had, had to use the bathroom, had to go to lunch. I haven't had a chance to think about them. You've had decades to deal with these things. And you don't. So yeah, institutions, including evangelical colleges, will turn to what the secular world does when trying to deal with these situations, right? Is affirmative action the best way to go about dealing with discrimination and hiring and accepting new students? I don't know. I don't know if that's the way the gospel would tell us to do it, but I don't see you doing anything. And we do know that affirmative action can result in a broader group of hires and a more diverse student body. It can actually give people skills and experience and credentials. But then they're no longer left on the outside when it comes time to promote people. We know that it can work, and you've given us nothing, so we're going to do that secular thing. So I thank the coat for, for arguing this. It gets at what I want to talk about. Now, the bad theology why hopefully you tuned in and hopefully are still watching. McDermott unveils his theology um, and it's, it's left wanting quite a bit. Um, McDermott comes after this sort of way of thinking and says, you know, they should be teaching, his quote from his article, uh, evangelical colleges should be teaching the beauty of salvation by the Trinitarian God. Um, this is a beautifully vacuous empty statement, right? If I say there is discrimination against black women in our school and you respond with ponder the beauty of salvation in the triune God, you just, you, you, you just kill them. You fill in space with words. You know, that that's nothing. That's, that's a that's a deflection. That's a parry. You know, I came at you with a thrust and you were just like, oh, I'm going to deal with this right now, right? Because we don't bother to define what on earth we're talking about or how that would do something. And McDermott kind of tries to, but he, he quotes an, an anonymous oppressed white male at Baylor saying that uh, all human beings are made in the image of God and have intrinsic dignity. Race or national origin should have no bearing on these truths. That is itself a, I would say, a true theological statement. That's a true doctrinal statement. All human beings are made in the image of God and have intrinsic dignity. And the ideas of race and national origin are, don't bear on that. I think that's a lovely statement. I think it's absolutely true. I come back to Bacote. 
So what are you doing about it? Right? And this is where the theology goes awry, um, is you either have a flat-out deflection with empty words, or you say something that is indeed true and then do nothing. And in times like that, there's a whole school of theology that has only grown since its inception. It says there's a way to respond. Generally speaking, and that this is the broadest strokes, and I know that the, somewhat of the irony of a, of a white male living in a small white city talking about this, but generally speaking, liberation theology argues that when theology either causes injustice or justifies injustice or through its silence does nothing to stop injustice, we have a problem that must be addressed. If your theology is causing injustice, something needs to be fixed. Right? Either your theology itself needs fixing or the way you carry it out, the way you use it, needs fixing. Right? And liberation theologies take all kinds of stripes. They're, they're feminist theology, womanist theology, um, Latin American, Latinx uh, liberation theology, black liberation theology, all different kinds, post-colonial. I'm going to leave out a whole crap ton here. And, and they're all ways of saying this is how theology has been used against us. And the theology needs fixing because it's causing a problem. Right? Bad theology, which this series is about, is like the first symptom that you need liberation theology or, or bad theology breeds liberation theology because is a response we have to get rid of this right? liberating us from bad theology is a good thing right? hopefully i didn't make or made it some sort of sense saying that so when theology produces supports or encodes injustice that theology needs attention and what you have here is theology that either is telling people who say, hey, you know, racism's real, there's discrimination at our school. Students are coming here and they're just carrying out the same racial uh, narrative over and over again. And it's time for us to learn that there are structures in place that, that perpetuate this. It's time for us to ask how has theology been used to oppress women or to justify uh, discrimination against Jews or other religious minorities. And the response is simply, ponder the beauty of salvation in the triune God. Or, do you know everyone's made in the image of God, but you're not actually doing anything. You're not actually fixing the problem. Your theology is bad. It's not being put into action, or it is being put into action for bad purposes. Because the, the statement that all human beings are made in the image of God and have intrinsic dignity, yeah, so where are the policies that enforce that, right? Where, where are the specifics that say this is how our institution is going to function, assuming these things are true? Where is the teaching that says our theology is going to be geared towards this and it's going to attack places where the theology has been used against equality and human dignity? It's not that tricky, really. And, and, and this is the part that always drives me nuts, is, you know, the, these arguments that, that come from folks like how McDermott does it here, that you're, you're bringing in these secular ideologies to deal with what should be a religious problem. You know, I'm inclined to agree somewhat because your theology should be preventing you from acting the way you're acting. If all people are created in the image of God and have human dignity, why the fuck are you acting the way you are? Right? If salvation in the triune God ends all racism, why are you so fucking racist? Right? Why are you attacking anti-racists, comparing them to Hitler and Stalin? Bad theology here is simply trying to cling to being white and saying there's nothing wrong with my being, wealthy, 
able to get into whatever doors I want to pass through, able to get into whatever club I want to be in, able to look down on people who are dark-skinned or who are women or who aren't Christian or whatever the hell it is I want to look down on. It's a frightened position, one that sees attempts to dismantle racism as a threat because they are a threat because you depend on the racism for who you are. It's time for a theology of liberation for oppressed white men who need to learn that they are more than white men. They are in fact beloved, made in the image of God with dignity that is completely separate from their whiteness or from their suburban homes or from the fact that they have penises instead of vaginas. They need to hear that message desperately and understand it and be taught that until they can understand it and act accordingly, they have to stop pushing around everybody else claiming that that was God's idea. Well, I've said what I think is enough. There's a lot more that I'd like to say. Discretion is the better part of valor in this case. McDermott's article is appalling. And speaking as his former student, no, this is bad theology. Thank you for being with me this week. I'll see you again next time. If you like this sort of thing, don't forget to subscribe, like, and drop a comment below. I, like I said earlier, I've got the listings for the, the articles in the video description below. Uh, and I'll see you all next time.